welcome to Local Foods College, uh, and thank you for joining us. So the Local Foods College, we are hosted by the Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. We are an organization that works statewide to connect Greater Minnesota with the resources available at the university. This session, uh, this Local Food College session is our seventh uh, annual, so uh, we are pleased to have been hosting this for seven years. And this uh, sheet here, this, this screen kind of gives you a good snapshot of all the topics that we have covered over the years, from new and unusual fruit to deep winter greenhouses to grazing and marketing. And you can access all of those subjects on our YouTube uh, channel if you are interested in learning more through this medium. Uh, Jerry Ford started growing garlic on his wife's family's 120-year-old farm in 2002. His award-winning porcelain cultivars have gained a reputation for both robust planting stock and excellent flavor. He has served as director of the Minnesota Garlic Festival since its inception 14 years ago and is now helping to lead a Minnesota Department of Agriculture specialty crop project, the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project. And with that, I will turn it over to Jerry. So some of the finest gourmet garlic in the country is actually being grown right here in Minnesota, as I'm sure some of you can attest. Uh, and uh, you can grow it right in your own gardens. Uh, it, believe me, if it was that hard to grow, I wouldn't be growing it. Uh, and I would be remiss if I didn't say that this is a presentation of the Minnesota Premium Garlic Project, the Department of Agriculture putting your tax dollars to great use. So uh, you've got that little place where you can check yes or no, uh, the, the green check mark, the red X. Uh, would you click the yes if you are currently growing garlic and the no if you're a wannabe? And if you've just figured out that you're in the wrong webinar, well, stick with us anyway. This is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, so as maybe Connie will let me know uh, how many people are, or if there are, if we're a majority of existing growers, um, or if we're one of these, if that's coming in. Uh, I don't have any yeses yet. I have two no's. So it sounds oh, like. Oh, well, good. I'll gear this for, and I think that um, maybe the Beth who is on is actually a very experienced grower, if that's Beth Wemkin uh, from the Duluth area. Uh, so some of this will be reviewed for her and she can check me on this and tell me what I did wrong later. Um, okay, so here's the way I like to do this with gardeners especially is to tell you the things you do wrong. Uh, now, my wife tells me I should always focus on the positive things, not the mistakes and the wrong things. So I balanced it out with a, a really cool picture of, of me with a great garlic crop there and a really hip t-shirt. Um, so first off, let's take a look at the actual, or the, a picture of the plant and make sure we're all using the same terms for this plant. Uh, you see the bulb in the bottom left there. Now, technically it's a head, but it's, we're going to call it a bulb. And the, the thing to the right there, the clove, is the thing that you break open from the bulb that you eat after you peel it. Well, that is the same thing you're going to plant. Uh, so then uh, the roots obviously come out from the bottom of that. And believe it, or not, those, believe it or not, those roots are a lot bigger than that. The, the roots can go 10 inches down or so. Uh, the leaves uh, actually are the wrappers that go around the bulb. You know how each bulb has a wrapper. And I, I don't know if I'm, yeah, there I am. See, it, they have those wrappers that go around that you peel off. And uh, that, each one of those represents a leaf. And actually the bottom leaves are the inside wrappers and the top leaves are the outside wrappers. And that will be important a little later. Now, you have that flower stalk up there that has an umbel with bulbules, which are just cool words to say. Uh, most people uh, think that the bulbules are the seeds. But you'll learn later it's not really 
um, it's not really a uh, seed, it's a bobio. We'll get to that. So that scape is the flower stalk that comes up from there. Now the botanists tell us it's not a true stalk on these plants, um, but it is a pseudo stalk, but we're gonna call it a stalk just for our own purposes. And just so everybody knows this, it's not like a tomato plant where you plant one plant and you get lots of tomatoes. It's a, it's a one for one thing. You plant one clove, you get one bulb. Uh, so, uh, then, the two different ways that we distinguish garlic in general and when we're growing it is whether or not it sends up that flower stalk, that scape, or does. Uh, and you see on the left you have a soft neck or non-bolting picture or drawing of a garlic, and then on the right you have the top of a bolting garlic. Um, so the, uh, that's the two main ways we distinguish the different kinds. And there are garlic cultivars that will only bolt under certain conditions. So there is some crossover here. In general, the soft necks are the ones that have adapted to warmer climates, and the hard necks thrive in colder places. Uh, the descriptions hard and soft refer to that stalk. The stalk will be stiffer some people say stiff neck. Uh, and we'll get to the kinds that I think you should be growing in just a minute here. So let's quickly talk about soft necks. And I'm going in reverse order from that chart you received just to see if you're paying attention. Uh, and you notice in this soft neck, it does not have a scape. It doesn't have the flower stalk. And you'll notice from your selection chart, uh, if you're looking at that, that I actually listed the silver skin on the left there as a hard neck. It's a crossover. Sometimes it's, it has a hard neck, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, fortunately, we don't have to deal with it too much because not a whole lot of people up here grow it. Um, the, in most grocery stores, what you're gonna find is these soft necks, and they're gonna come from China, California, Spain, uh, and they're more adapted, like I said, to the warm climate. If you're going to grow soft necks in Minnesota, I recommend you start with the artichokes, the one on the, on the right there. Now, why do I say if? Because, and I'll get to that. So before I get to why I'm saying if, notice how many cloves there are. And again, if you've bought grocery store garlic for the most part, you see this. There's lots of little cloves in there. Uh, and that's a cool thing if you like lots of cloves, smaller, numerous cloves to work with. And the other thing about lots of cloves is when you go to plant, because the thing you eat is the thing you plant, it's uh, going to give you lots of plants, okay? If they survive. Um, it's a southern garlic, it may not like it so much here. Uh, so uh, the, they are braidable, these are advantages. If you wanna grow garlic that you can make braids out of, they're pretty, they're a great way to store them, sure, grow soft necks. Uh, they're, boy, they don't like it, the cold weather up here, and you have to baby them along. We're gonna talk about mulch in a little bit. The less mulch part of it is such that uh, you can't put much mulch on it, so hey, you don't have to find as much mulch to put on it. The disadvantage is that you can't put much mulch on it, and it's gonna get weeds, uh, and it might get killed by the winter time. No scapes is good because as you'll see shortly, we remove the scapes and that's another job you have to do for the hard neck garlics. The disadvantage of no scapes is scapes really taste good uh, and you don't have any. Uh, all right, so enough about the soft necks until question and answer if you wanna ask more about them. With the hard necks, uh, they used to think that it was a separate species altogether, but it's not. They're finding now it's all allium sativum. It's all just garlic. It's the way they react to stress. Because this bolting thing is a reaction to stress. Um, basically, the, the plant is saying, uh, just in case I can't reproduce through the bulb, if that's not gonna be the way that I make more little mini me's out there, uh, then it's gonna, it has a backup system. These hard necks have a backup system and they make little bitty mini me clones up there in the flower stalk. 
what most people call garlic seeds, but they're not. Uh, so uh, the hardnecks, and I'm, you probably figured out, I'm going to recommend that, especially if you're just getting started, you grow hardneck garlics. And I'm even going to get more specific than that. So I think, and if you look at your chart, I, I believe, and uh, backed up by a lot of other folks with this, that the porcelains tend to be the very hardiest of the hardnecks. And when I say hardy, I mean they're more tolerant of extreme conditions. And being here in Minnesota, and I notice a few of you are like further north than I am, we have this extreme thing called winter. Uh, and by being hardy, they are more likely to produce big bulbs. Connie's heard me say this before, but I like big bulbs and I cannot lie. Uh, so uh, in the number of cloves that go with these hard necks, the porcelains have the fewest number of cloves normally. Uh, this little bulb that I have right here, it only has three cloves in there. Uh, it, normally they'll have four to six, but this one only had three. Uh, and it increases as you go down the list of those uh, hard neck garlics. Uh, it seems to be directly related. Uh, and I'm, 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 I would bet my life on it. Uh, the, the fewer cloves, the hardier it's going to be. And if you think about it, it's build, it's got a store of energy in that big clove. And so it's got all that energy to feed off of through the winter, uh, and, and it's just going to um, make bigger bulbs. Um, so here's my recommendations for the hard necks that you should grow. There are the porcelains and purple stripes. And uh, I think that uh, there's I'm just going to put it this way. Start with these, get your chops, move on to other kinds of garlic. Uh, so here's, there's some game winning advantages to porcelains and purple stripes. They make these big, tasty, hearty bulbs, uh, consistently winning, you know, taste testing contests and all uh, um, with the, with the porcelains. And, the problem with those big few cloves per bulbs is, bulb is you're going to get fewer plants. If you buy a pound of bulbs and there's only five pound, five bulbs in that pound, some fairly nice sized bulbs, uh, you're only going to get 20 plants. Whereas if you buy the artichokes, you might get 60 plants. Again, will they survive? Um, okay. So I'm recommending porcelains and purple stripes. Here are some of the cultivars or varieties of uh, porcelains that are out there. I, I grow the three on the left, Armenian Music and German Extra Hardy, because I just like them and they thrive on neglect and they've, they've done very, very well for me. Um, Generally, the porcelains are also known to store the best. And I only grow porcelain garlics now. Um, my wife and I uh, were eating 2017 garlic as we were harvesting the 2018 garlic. So it stored for a year, uh, and it was still good, quite good. Um, so all of that can change with conditions. This was such a weird year, a weird season for garlic, that, that I'm not making any guarantees about storage this year. But generally, the portions store really well. Now, the purple stripes, they are the heirlooms. They are the ones most closely related to the progenitor of all garlic, which came from eastern, uh, sorry, western China, uh, way up in the uh, high plateaus uh, where it never gets above 50 degrees. That's the original garlic. So the, and, and the purple stripe uh, on the right there of these three groups of purple stripe, the original purple stripe is that stuff. I mean, it's like, it's like the dinosaur of garlic. Um, so these, there are three distinct groups and then there are uh, these varietal cultivars within those groups. In Minnesota, Matechi and Chestnut Red are the 
probably the most common groan. By the way, I'm going to pop back for just a second. Music is probably the most common garlic grown of all the garlics in Minnesota. Um, I think if you ask uh, most of the growers, well, what's the typical Minnesota garlic? They'll say it's music. Came out of Canada via Eastern or came out of Eastern Europe via Canada. Um, okay, so on these purple stripes, uh, you can't really go wrong with them. They're going to be they're going to do well for you under uh, even extreme conditions. Okay, so we're on to that thing that first mistake that growers make: the wrong seed. Uh, and I uh, want to remind you that what you eat is what you plant. That same clove is what you're going to plant. These are cloves in this picture here, ready to go at my farm. So in addition to picking the right cultivars, like we just talked about, I want you to think of garlic as a perennial, as in something that would just keep right on growing, that you wouldn't have to replant every year, which is true. If you left it in the ground, it would keep growing. It'd be what we call a weed. Um, so it is a member of the lily family, and you can, like lilies, separate them and replant them. And as a matter of fact, they like that. Um, now, the fact that it's a perennial also su um, uh, supports the high price. Good seed garlic is expensive. But the thing is, you're going to buy good stuff once, acclimate it to your soil, to your conditions, and keep replanting from your own. So that's why I like you to think about it as like a perennial. Um, should Are there any questions coming up yet, Connie? I haven't seen any, but just as a reminder, if anyone wants to send in a question, feel free to put it in chat, and I'll make sure Jerry hears it. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, buying local is a catchphrase, of course. It's fashionable to buy local, and it's good for local economies, but that's not the only reason, and not even the best reason, to buy your seed garlic local. If you get your seed from someone who's already growing it relatively near you, uh, then they probably saved you a year or two of work. Garlic adapts to its conditions, and it can often take one, two, three years for it to catch up to your conditions if you get it from, you know, New York State or, heaven forbid, somewhere down south. Um, so you're ahead of the game if you buy it from somebody already in Minnesota uh, and it's already adapted to our conditions or, or the Dakotas surrounding states. The closer the better if it's good stuff, and we'll, we'll talk about how to tell the good stuff. Um, and I have the Garlic Festival logo up there because that is – the primo place to buy your seed garlic. Unfortunately, it's already happened. Uh, it is the second Saturday in August down in Hutchinson. And you can see more seed garlic than you'd ever care to in one place. Uh, now, I, I want you to check for disease when you go to buy your seed garlic. That's hard to do from a catalog because you can't see it, right? Um, the uh, you're gonna you're gonna take your bulb and you're gonna you're gonna give it some feeling here and find out if there's any soft spots. You don't want soft spots in there. You want the skins to be mostly intact uh, around there, uh, surrounding it, so that it's not exposing the clothes. Uh, you don't want to see blotches in there, like these gray blotches and all. It's not a, a it's not a game ender, but it's it's a uh, if you have a choice, don't buy the the bulbs that have the blotches. Uh, and you're going to want to look at the, let's see, am I holding this up in the right direction? The root base, where the roots would normally come off of there, that's where most disease starts in the garlic bulb. If it's separated around there, if parts of it aren't there, if it's mushy at all, do not buy that. It has got any number of diseases. Uh, so. There's a lot of information on garlic disease stuff. I mean, if you just really can't sleep some night, go to the Garlic Project website and uh, and look up information on the different kinds of diseases with garlic. You'll, uh, I don't know, it's the kind of thing that makes <laughs> you say, I don't want to grow it, but it actually has less disease problems than a lot of other vegetables. 
Uh, and here's another tip. If you pick up that bulb and you sniff it from a good garlic grower, what should you smell? Nothing. But you're like, well, garlic stinks. Yeah, but if it's been properly cured and properly cared for, it's sealed in there. It should not smell like garlic till you open that clove up and peel the clove. Uh, if it's got any kind of bad smell to it, I don't think I'd buy it. Um, now, I wanted to mention the absolute worst, the real bugaboo of a, a disease here. We've had very few cases of garlic bloat nematode in, in Minnesota, partly because we do a rigorous testing program now. We saw it coming from another state, and we make all the growers at the garlic festival test for it or they don't get in. Um, when you go to buy your seed garlic, ask if they've tested for garlic bloat nematode. And if they have not, then uh, call me and I'll give you a series of other questions to ask them. Um, it's, uh, it's a problem that can just ruin your garden. If you bring in the GBN from outside, it, it'll infect the garden and you won't be able to grow alliums there anymore. You won't grow your onions, your leeks, anything like that. Uh, and you certainly won't grow garlic there anymore. Okay, so garlic prevention. Uh, inspect it, try to be where you can look at that seed garlic. Uh, ask for tested seed. Once you've established your own, um, once you've established your own seed bank, I, well, you're not going to be bringing any diseases in from outside. So at least you've eliminated that. There are some soil-borne diseases, but uh, but that's a good way to control diseases. Grow from your own seed stock. Now, rotation is one of the most important things. If you plant it this year in a spot. Don't come back to that same spot for at least four years. Okay, I've been growing garlic since 2002, and I've never planted in the same place twice. Now, I have 113 acres, but uh, uh, in your own gardens, even if you just move two feet away, that's good. So don't plant in the same place two times in a row. Wait four years to come back, if at all possible. Now, moisture is uh, an interesting thing with garlic. Uh, I used to say it doesn't like to keep its feet wet. Well, it kind of actually does. What it doesn't like to do is stand in water that isn't moving. It wants the water to keep moving through. Um, so hillsides, raised beds, uh, anything but a low ground, basically. If the water, if it's new water all the time coming through there, then it's really, it's, it's not likely to get disease problems. It's if it's standing in the same water for a period of time, for a long period of time, then it, it's likely to, de to, to develop some um, diseases, uh, mostly the fungal type things. Uh, and it's it, it just like, it, you know, it'll stay, you can keep it wet. It's okay to keep it wet. We used to say don't. It's also okay to let it dry out and then water it again. Um, as long as that water's moving. I think I've hit that point over the head a few times now. Uh, roguing, throwing away plants. If you go out in your garlic patch and you see plants that are yellowed down and it's June, pull them out of there and throw them away. Get rid of them. Get them out of there so you're not giving that uh, pathogen something to feed on. I know it's hard to do, but uh, be ruthless about it. All right. Here's, uh, you know, I just think it's, um, it, it's, it's a good reason to buy local seed garlic because it costs less. Um, and, and the wrong seed garlic is stuff you paid too much for. Uh, so you can see from the numbers here, uh, most of the Minnesota growers who are selling to you directly, their prices can be half what you see in the seed catalogs. Um, okay, so you can, uh, buying these big cloves, getting these this great seed that's big, going to make big cloves for you, and then you can go to, you know, state fair and garlic festival and, and win a bunch of bragging rights and, and, and uh, ribbons. Uh, and again, that, the, the Tom Kaufman here 
I would not be at all surprised if he'd been growing from the same seed stock over replanting it each year for that bulb for, for 10 years or more. Um, and they don't seem to peter out. Uh, they're going to do that in the first year or two. They just will get to a certain point and then just kind of, they'll get better and better and then they'll just level off and stay that good for quite some time. Um, now we had some problems this year and I'll, we can talk more about that in Q&A if you want to. The, this was a really bad year for garlic. Uh, and once you've got that uh, one that likes you, that variety that likes you, keep planting that. I've had two of my genetic lines since 2002, the uh, music and the Armenian, and then I added the German in 2012. Uh, okay, planting. So in that wrong time mistake, garlic growers, you plant at the wrong time. It's kind of a nebulous answer, but it's fall. It's, if you see seed garlic in the, seed, in the garden stores in the spring, just turn up your nose at it and walk away. Or, you know, if the price is right, eat it. Uh, but don't <laughs> plant it. Uh, it's, it's the wrong time to plant garlic, especially the northern garlics that we like to grow up here. They give us big bulbs. Uh, they require vernalization. They need to spend the winter in the ground not in the shed, not uh, in a cupboard somewhere, but in the ground. They need to spend that winter. Uh, they just seem to like that. That's what they need for their growth cycle. Um, you can probably tell I don't have a botany degree. Uh, so the, what about your soil? There's these, these three things are important, but if you get this first one, lots of organic matter going, it will kind of take care of the other two. Uh, so it's um, compost, planting uh, in fallow ground. You know, if you can dig up some pasture somewhere or uh, a meadow and plant there, it's probably going to be really high in organic matter, uh, and, and it's probably going to do some of the best garlic I ever grew was after plowing up a alfalfa field. Um, and since we're planting in the fall, you could plant other stuff before it. I mean, if you're already growing beans in your garden, any kind of legumes, uh, peas, beans, all that, garlic loves to follow those legumes because what? They're putting nitrogen into the soil. Um, now, the, uh, so I, I can't emphasize organic matter enough, uh, getting compost, manure, whatever in there. Um, now that soil pH thing, I'm not going to belabor this point. Uh, Master Gardeners Extension folks can help you out with that. You, pH tests are easy to do, you know, a little litmus paper or whatever it's called, um, uh, or there's a little like $5 probe that you can put in the ground. Um, and if it's not in that mid range, then the extension folks and all can help you uh, balance that. And if you're interested in knowing more about the um, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, et cetera, things that need to be in the soil. You can contact me or some of it's on the website. Uh, but generally, if you don't do fertilize, if you don't do soil tests on your soil, if you don't know what's in your soil, go really easy on the fertilizer. You, you, can, um, you can really do some damage by doing too much. Uh, keep it very um, low impact fertilizers, no miracle grow or anything like that. Um, now, if your soil is sandy, then you might want to do some spring fertilization. If you've got good heavy loam soil or, um, or even clay, try to get all that fertilization in in the, in the fall, because they do grow in the fall. When you put that clove in the ground in the fall, it puts roots down uh, and it starts drawing nutrients into itself. But if you're in sandy soil, it, it wouldn't hurt to do some fish emulsion or something like that in the spring. Um, uh, we can talk more about that in Q&A if you like. Uh, you want good, you know, it's, uh, you know what a bag of like a good composted topsoil looks like coming from the, 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 nur the nursery? You want your soil to kind of look like that. You want it nice and loose, not only so that the roots can go down deep, 
But uh, the bulbs, and like all your root crops, they're pushing against the soil. They're wanting to expand out against that soil. Uh, so if the soil is packed around it, well, it's not going to like that. Uh, so nice, loose soil. Um, and let's see where I am at this point. Uh, so friable, we call it, good friable soil. You can see I use a very heavy-duty sort of uh, tiller here with the tractor, and then I touch up with a walk-behind tiller. But you can do it with soil fork and double digging and all that. Um, this is how I lay out my garlic beds. And you don't, you know, you're probably, unless you're really getting into it, you're not going to do 50 foot long beds. But my point is that eight inches apart. Uh, for me, that's about the premium sort of range. Uh, I don't think you need to go more than eight inches. I wouldn't go less than six inches apart between those plants. They, they seem to have kind of a striking range, you know, of, around them that they, they're going to draw the nutrients from that uh, 12 inches or so uh, diameter around them. Uh, so not less than six inches apart. And then make sure you're planting. Uh, this is almost one of those duh things. Make sure you plant it right side up. Uh, so if, uh, I don't know how well you can see this, but here's this clove, right? And there's this flat part at the bottom that is the root base. And then there's, and especially in these porcelain garlics, this nice uh, thing that says, hey, I'm the top. It almost looks like a Hershey's Kiss there. Um, and, uh, oh, a new Hershey's Kiss flavor. Um, so make sure you put that side down. Now, this can be a little hard to tell with small cloves. From those soft necked garlics, it can be a little hard to tell which is up. Uh, but you're going to plant that side down so that the stem, when it's coming out, doesn't have to fight you know, being turned around the wrong way. It'll, def it'll still probably come up, but it'll deform the bulb. With these porcelains and the pur uh, purple stripes, you don't have to go deep. Plus, we're going to mulch, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But you don't have to go deep. I plant so that that little curly cube, uh, not curly cube, but that little tag there, they're actually still sticking out. The tip of the clove is just below the surface. Further north, you might want to go a little deeper. Um, but you don't have to go deep with these northern garlics. Uh, let's see. So I'm at planting in depth, spacing, depth. What else do I want to say that? Okay, so there's some people use dibbles. You can see in the picture on the left here, that's like a, a thing you can step on and it makes all the little holes in the ground. These, my point is you could put, like, you could pre-mark your holes uh, eight inches apart and then put the clothes down in there, uh, and it gets much more elaborate. There's farms that have these barrels that go behind the tractor and mark the holes. I personally use a jig that shows me as we go down the line where to put each clove, um, but it's a way to kind of reinforce that spacing. Okay, talking about mulch. Uh, yes, it's winter protection. It's going to protect from the cold to keep things from freezing. And we did have freeze damage in garlic this year because of that darn mid-April blizzard. Uh, and then um, it also protects from uh, heaving. You know, if you get a if you were bare ground and you had frost, thaw, frost, thaw, it could pull that clove right up out of the ground. Uh, and the the mulch helps to moderate that. Uh, then um, the moisture control, again, that thing of the moisture moving through all the time, you're going to water a whole lot less if you have mulch on top of there, and it's going to be more consistent water. And then I know everybody, I'm not going to make you click the green arrow if you love weeding, um, but uh, I, no, okay, all of us don't like weeding. Uh, so uh, it's going to be weed control, and I'll show you a little more about that in a moment. The picture there, the little green sprouts that are coming up, that's actually about six inches of mulch. You don't have to do that much, but I do because what? I can. And um, so the plant is actually, you know, eight inches tall or so by the time it pokes through that, that mulch, and it loves it that way. Um, 
So here's where here's a, a whole um, strip we're on contours on our farm because of the hilliness, uh, and uh, Emily's a, a celebrating that we finally finished the darn mulch. Um, and yes, those are pink flamingos. Uh, and then the here and uh, the picture on the right. I mean, we're actually mulching after a snowfall. You don't have to mulch right away. It's probably better if you do, but uh, as you can see, I mean, this was probably after Thanksgiving by the time we got the mulch on. Uh, it just happens sometimes, and, it, and it, it's pretty forgiving. Um, okay, there, there's the garlic field in the wintertime, and just try to keep the snowmobiles off of it. Uh, any questions there, Connie? Nope, I've sent out a reminder, and if uh, uh, anybody well, has anything I, they want to ask, feel free to just type it in chat, yeah. and I'll make sure Jerry hears it. I've been going, so droning on here, they're probably all on YouTube right now, saying, oh, there's bound <laughs> to be somebody interesting talking about garlic somewhere. Um, so in the springtime, you can look under the mulch. You know, once you have, oh, I see that question about soaking. Yep. We'll get to that. Yeah, remind me, and we'll get to that one. I, the, and then we have, uh, a, we have a mulch question. What do you recommend for mulch? Okay, let's talk about that right now uh, since we're on mulch because I'm avoiding that that, uh, that dip <laughs> question. That uh, it, No, I'm not. I, I use chopped up corn stalks because that's what I have. Um, we, are, we have livestock and we do bedding for the animals. It's the same thing I use for the bedding. Uh, straw, wheat straw, oat straw. Uh, um, even now we're getting, getting a lot of rye straw around. That's all great. Look at the bales. When you buy the small bales, uh, look at them and make sure there's not a lot of seeds in there, that they got it, you know, they got the seeds out when they combined, because otherwise you'll have a nice um, oat crop uh, growing in your mulch, um, which isn't the worst thing. It's better than ragweed. Um, leaves can work, but I've heard more people say, yeah, and then they blew away. I, you know, it's like they dry up in the springtime and they blow away. Um, and, but they can work. It's going to take a lot of leaves. Uh, you want something with some fluff in it, like that straw. Um, uh, yeah, yeah. Get go down to the, the feed store and get some good straw. Not now. You can also use hay. You can use hay if it's hay that was taken before the the plants that's in the hay go to seed. You know, if it's good hay that's that doesn't have lots of seeds in it, uh, hay will work fine as a mulch too. Uh, and maybe we can bring up some other kinds of mulch that people are trying. In the springtime, once you can, once you can check under that mulch, because this garlic is going to start growing in April. I mean, it's 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 got like some sort of internal clock. A mothership communicates with it, or something. I think they're all alien, um, and and they gives them the signal to start growing in April, and they'll start coming up underground. Uh, and it's okay to pull off some mulch and see how they're doing. If you see them kind of lying over on their side a bit, or if they seem to have trouble getting through the mulch, then you can pull off some. Or we do what we call fluffing it. We go down there with a pitchfork and we just kind of fluff the mulch up so that it gives it a little easier time to get through. Um, this year was different, uh, but we can talk about that later if, if you want. Uh, so um, we'll move on on mulch if we. Good. Okay. Uh, and is this yes? the time that you wanted to address the uh, alcohol soak prior to planting? Okay, we can go ahead and do that. <laughs> uh, we're actually with the Premium Garlic Project. We're going to do a, uh, some research on that, and there has been a limited amount of research. We're actually going to soak the clothes before planting. So we're going back now before planting, and we're going to soak the clothes first in a solution of fish oil, and all of these are certified organic approved practices that I'm recommending here. If, if, I'm going to say this. 
and, and I'm not a, a I'm not an apostle for certified organic, but if you if you have to use non-organic practices to grow garlic, something is wrong. You know, something else is wrong. Um, there's only one instance where I can think of where you need to use conventional methods, and it's very rare. So we're going to put soak those cloves first in in the um, fish emulsion, you know, like dead fish bits, uh, or in this, and for a day. And then we're going to take them out of that, and we're going to soak them in vodka. Um, now, all of our, our research growers, I sent them the fish emulsion, emulsion, and I told them they're on their own for the vodka. Uh, and I can imagine some of them are going to make some pretty wicked martinis with the, um, those cloves. But uh, the point of an alcohol, uh, and I wouldn't use isopropyl, by the way, use use like Everclear or, or vodka of some sort. Um, the point of it is that it, it probably will kill uh, fungus and some bacterias, mites. There are garlic mites. It, it, it will probably kill those. Uh, and then, of course, with the fish emulsion, we're giving it a shot of fertilizer, basically, hoping that it's going to soak up the fertilizer. And people, there just hasn't been a lot of good research on it. There's a lot of um, anecdotal uh, evidence out there about these dips. And some people have, oh, just all these wicked sort of dips they do with their, their garlic. Now, I plant 6,000 garlic plants. It's going to take like a feed trough, uh, feed uh, stock tank, if I'm going to soak all of that. And with these experiments, we're only doing a small amount. But if you, yeah, you can't do it any real harm. Now, with the alcohol, how long, uh, uh, the, yeah. Somebody's right with me on this. Uh, with the alcohol, no more than an hour. Get it out of there in the hour, and, and don't be sampling the bottle in the in between time because you might lose track of the time. Uh, speaking of speaking of which, this picture is of a weeding party. How was that for a segue? Uh, here's a weeding party going on. Uh, we just kind of invite friends over and say, "Hey, let's make a pass through the garlic and do a weeding." Uh, this bunch obviously started the partying part before the weeding part. Um, that's actually my wife lying down in the middle there. Uh, and, but, you know, it's kind of a fun activity to bring your friends over for, and it goes a lot faster. Uh, and if you bribe them with some of that vodka that was left over from the dip. Um, so with this kind of mulching that I do, I weed maybe three times, and it's just going through by hand and pulling up thistles tend to push through the mulch, uh, and a couple other things like bindweed will get in there. Um, but otherwise, the weeding is so easy. Um, okay, so watering, we were talking about water a bit. Yes, you can water it, and if you're in raised beds that tend to dry out, look, look just do this. Pick up the mulch, look, if it's wet under there, don't water it. If it isn't wet, then maybe you should give it some water. Now, these, these folks in this picture, these are my pen pals over in China who are growing garlic there. Uh, and obviously, they're watering it. Um, it's been really interesting talking to Chinese growers about the way they do garlic. Uh, OK, let's see, where are we? We are looking at scapes. OK, so when you're growing this hard neck garlic, and in June, sometime in June, it's going to put out this little curly cue. And you need to go down there and watch for this, because they'll, that's why they call it scape, I think, is because it escapes your attention. Um, no, it's not why, but uh, once it starts making that little curly cue, like the stuff in the bottom left here, those are a bunch of them taken off and put in a box. Uh, and there's good reason to do that. Uh, even less than that curly cue in the picture in the middle. You're going to take it off right above that top leaf. Now, why are you going to do that? Number one, it's delicious. If you get it when it's making that first curly cue, it is almost like regular garlic, just slightly different. People are making pesto, they're putting them in salads, they're grilling them, uh, and they will keep in the refrigerator for oh, uh, three, four weeks uh, really nicely. 
The other thing is, uh, if by taking that off, it's going to increase the size of the bulb. It's like the plant's got this backup reproduction system here in that scape. And when you take that off, it's like, whoa, hey, the backup's gone. We better put all of our energy in the bulb. Uh, they don't actually say that, um, but maybe they do. If you let them go, if you, and, and you might every year, like, let a couple of them go because they are the coolest looking plant. I mean, this thing on the right here is one of those bulbules about to burst open, or the umbels about to burst open with the bulbules. That plant is about five feet tall. Uh, it's, you know, the little leaf part of the plant is only maybe 18 inches or so, but that scape, on, especially on porcelain, will go up almost as tall as I am. Uh, once they get like that, they're hard to clip. You're going to use your nice pruners. When they're small, you can snap them with your fingers. Uh, moving on from scapes, unless somebody wants to talk about them more. Harvesting. This is one of the most stressful times of the year for me because it's like uh, I want to harvest at exactly the right time for the premium garlic bulbs. Um, here's the rule of thumb I'm going to give you. If you look at this plant here, that brown sheath, I don't know if you guys see my cursor or not, um, but uh, uh, the brown sheath at the bottom of that stalk is the first leaf. It's already gone, okay? Then to the left, that yellow part is the second leaf, and then the big, there's that big leaf there uh, that is uh, starting to turn color, okay? When the bottom three have gone brown, it's time to harvest. The, not, the bulbs aren't going to get any bigger. And you don't want all of them to go brown because it will compromise the wrappers around the bulb. So you're looking for the bottom three, but keep in mind that that bottom one is gone by that time. It, you, all you'll see is the sheet. Uh, so that is our, our uh, rule of thumb. Generally, it's going to happen in mid-July. Um, so uh, that's, I stress about it. I just, I go out there and I talk to the garlic and like, should I dig this out? Um, which is going to get me some therapy one of these days. Uh, okay, so harvesting, actually pulling them up. If you've had good mulch on there, consistent moving through type most moisture, and you're growing these stiff neck, hard neck garlics, which have what? Really hard stalks on them, really tough stalks. You can just pull them straight out of the ground. You don't have to dig. Uh, I mean, that's fellas just doing it right there. Uh, and it just pulls straight up. You just pull straight up. It'll come, it will probably come out of the ground. We always have a soil fork nearby. Make sure you put the fork straight down so you don't nick your, your garlic bulb. It won't store as well if it gets any nicks to it. Um, but generally, you're going to be able to just pull them out of the ground, uh, and, and hopefully they'll be nice and big like these. Um, okay. Then the curing process. You're going to want to have a way to put your garlic together and, and cure where it can cure with airflow and being able to keep the humidity somewhat controlled if at all possible. So what we do is we bundle them up in bundles of 10, uh, and then we hang them up. We have a grid that runs all across our shed uh, that becomes the garlic shed at this time of the year. And you can see they're hanging up there kind of uh, in an X pattern. Uh, to Off of my left shoulder, you see there's two different bundles there. And again, the whole point is to get airflow. Now, you don't have to put them up in the air. If you've got just uh, screens or, or chicken wire or something, you can hang them on. The whole point, and I'm just going to hit this again, is airflow. Uh, you want there to be air moving so that the outside wrappers are, oh, by the way, this is what 6,000 garlic bulbs look hanging overhead. Um, 
you're going to leave the stalks and roots on. Okay, and this is this is me. This is a lot of people do it, but the the commercial garlic growers, the big ones in California, don't. If you leave the stalks and roots on, it's going to protect the bulb more, and it's going to absorb the energy out of those stalks and roots into the bulb. There was actually a study that showed after harvesting with the stalks and roots on, the bulb actually gets a little bigger. Not a lot, but it gets a little bigger. And then, of course, as it, it starts to uh, cure, it's going to lose a little bit. Um, then you're going to get all the, have I said airflow enough? Yeah. Um, then if you can control humidity, because this is what, July? It's going to be humid. Um, and if you can control humidity, I, my shed is insulated. I can close it up and I run a dehumidifier in there along with four high-powered fans just blowing on them constantly. My electric bill goes through the roof at that point. Um, if you're not doing humidity control, it's going to be four weeks or so. But don't cure them out where they're going to get direct, no direct sunlight. You can do that in the field for a little while right after you harvest, but no direct sunlight. Now, it's it's like, okay, when is it done curing? Well, the whole stalk is going to be brown. That whole long stalk is going to be brown uh, or yellowish. And when you cut the stalk, you don't get any juice coming out. Uh, then you've sealed. What you've done is you've put this perfect package around that bulb. The, the outer skins have dried around it, but it's sealed in all the moisture of the inner skins and the cloves. And that's what you're going for. Um, then how do you store it? Once you've got it all nice and cured, if you don't cure it, it's not going to store well. If you cure it well, it, and the other thing about curing, by the way, is it mellows the flavor. Garlic has that burn to it. And uh, if you've ever eaten fresh garlic right out of the field, it will just knock your top of your head off. Um, so the curing actually mellows that flavor a bit. It's still going to have some burn right after you peel it, but it, it, I think it helps to enrich the flavor. Jerry, is so there when a you're, temperature that's too hot when no, curing garlic? They, people, I mean, unless you're going to, like, really try to make it too hot. They're, they did a study in New York, and that's a great question. Uh, they did a study in New York State, upstate New York, where they uh, – we're doing them in high tunnels with shade cloth over it, and it was 110 degrees inside the high tunnels. It did not affect the curing. You, garlic doesn't mind 110 degrees, and it doesn't mind 30 degrees. It's more, shall I say, airflow again, uh, and some humidity control if you can do it. If you're doing it out in your shed, uh, three-sided in your garage or something, it's going to be harder, but put some fans on it. Um, okay, so did that answer the question, I think, probably? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Yep. If not, yeah. Oh, thanks, Miranda. Um, uh, so you're going to clip those roots. You know, you can, you can clip them right up to the root base if you want to. Some people like to wash the garlic. I don't like to get any water on the garlic, but some people like to wash it and have these long stringy roots on it, and that can be kind of cool, too. Um, then, uh, but I like to trim it to about a quarter of an inch, mainly because I'm selling garlic and I don't want to charge people too much for stuff they're not eating. They're not eating the roots. Well, you know, I can add weight to it. Um, so, and then stalks to an inch or so. I like an inch because that kind of guarantees you're not going to damage the cloves and get the dirt off of it. You can remove those outer wrappers. Let's see if I can do this. Like, and. Oh, there goes some outer wrappers off of the clothes. And then it's going to be just pretty and white underneath there, like these in the bowl here. Um, then storing it, you know, once it's too cold to store it out in the shed anymore, bring it inside. Indirect, all one word, indirect light. Not it, you don't want direct sunlight on it, but do not put it in the dark. Don't put it in the refrigerator. Don't put it in the pantry. There's one exception to this, and we can talk about it if you want to, but you're not going to be able to do it at home. There is a better storage method than this, but you can't do it at home. Um, 
So you're going to keep, again, airflow going and indirect light, not direct light. And like I said, we stored it, that very bowl that you're seeing there is a nice kind of specialized colander bowl uh, to keep some more airflow going through there and stored a year this past um, season, I, which I, man, to me, that's money in the bank. Hanging it in those ropes or braids also does a very, I mean, put it up and, and put it out where your, you know, your friends can come over and be jealous. Um, okay, so with this slide, I'm again going to say, hey, look, you can win all kinds of awards uh, like Susan there. And you can go eat garlic ice cream at the Garlic Festival, 14th annual one's coming up next year. Uh, and so um, that's just a, a shameless plug for Garlic Festival. Uh, and okay, it's final exam time. I don't know if we can actually answer these questions with the chat function, but first thing I said was gardeners often do the wrong seed. What's the right seed? What are the characteristics of good seed? Is anybody typing? They're, they're oh, all like, I can't, <laughs> they can't believe that test anxiety. Can Local seed Local. is what Miranda said. Yeah, and you know, I'm seeing that on my screen. This is pretty cool. Uh, at least one thing worked right about the technology. Uh, so local is, and that's one of the most important, checking for disease. We want to make sure you check for disease. Healthy, thank you, Miranda. Uh, healthy seed. And, of course, if you're like me, you know, I, I'm from Texas. I don't know, you probably couldn't tell that, but um, I'm from Texas, and I, I just like big bulbs. You know, everything's bigger in Texas, but... Uh, and, and it's not. The garlic in Texas is not nearly as nice as the stuff here, by the way. Um, so, yeah, uh, start with big stuff and, and local stuff, and you're going to save yourself some, uh, some acclimating time. You can have good garlic the first year. Um, now, don't give up on it if it stays small the first year. Replant and see what it does. You're in it for the long haul on this. Okay, so what's the wrong time or what's the right time of year? Nobody. Come on, Miranda. Ah, here we go. Connie says it's 7.05. No, that's not the right time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. Thank you. Yes, Miranda's fault. Uh, <laughs> that was good timing there. Um, okay. And then, so yes, in the fall, you could, you could, it, you folks further up north, you could start next week. Uh, what are your largest bulbs? Uh, I, 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 we actually regularly, in a good year, not this one, um, our farm gets bulbs that are over three inches in diameter, and that um, four of them will make a pound, uh, quarter pound bulbs. Uh, they're monsters. They're, yeah. Uh, so the wrong place, uh, I'm going to go ahead and give you this one. You want a place that's well drained. You want a place that you haven't planted it in the last four years, right? And you want a place with lots of organic matter in it. So those are the most important things. And here we are at contact information and uh, question and answers. Miranda has a question here about, uh, do you ever plant large bubbles such as Carpathian? Well, Carpathian is a large is known for getting large, and I forget if it's a purple stripe. Um, is it in the? Is it in that handout that we gave? Uh, it's a variety. It's a land race. Uh, I don't. Is there a place called Carpathia? I don't know if it came from such a place. Um, but yeah, I've seen some some large Carpathian bulbs in the past. I don't. I've never grown it myself. Uh, almost all garlic will get those soft necks will get big. Um, but not as consistently. Uh, you bought it from Hawk Spring, from Susan Johnson. Okay, yeah, uh, yeah, that's right. That's where I've seen it before. Yeah, she often wins the early growing contest with, with that one. Um, I, I keep threatening to make her a judge so that maybe I could win one here. Yeah. And it's also just fine to contact me with questions. Believe it or not, the that your tax dollars are paying me to answer people's garlic questions. Uh, so feel free to 
to send me questions. All right. So um, if there aren't any more questions, um, go back to... Uh, so Jerry just oh, needs do to I need stop to... his screen share. Okay. Uh, uh, stop sharing. That sounds kind of crude, stop sharing. <laughs> Okay, I'm not sharing anymore. And I have my screen back, so we're in great shape. Thank you so much, Jerry. I never get tired of listening to you talk about garlic, and I, uh, and I always, always learn something, so thank you. So for attendees, thank you, too, for sitting through. Please fill out the evaluation, uh, and you can find more information about uh, this and RSDP and all the good things we do on Facebook. If you really enjoyed this experience, please uh, send out some social media alerts and let your friends know um, about what we're doing. And join us next week because next week, Cindy Tong and Suzanne Dressen will be sharing how to store fall vegetables, which is pretty fantastic. So we can make our squash and other uh, crops last a little bit longer so we can enjoy our summer crops a little bit longer. So with that, thank you everyone and have a great week. Thank you.